logo. We can be. Yeah. Oh my God! To see you. We meet again. We meet again.
<laughs> Thank you, Vaughn. Can I carry on? Is this far enough? Oh, is it on? Okay. All right. Good evening, friends, colleagues, students, and other guests who are either in person or joining us online. Uh, I'm Professor Harsha Kathad, uh, Acting DBC for Teaching and Learning um, at the University of Cape Town, and it is my pleasure to welcome you to this very special occasion uh, to celebrate our dear colleague, Professor Romy Parker, the Director of the Pain Management Institute uh, Unit uh, in the Department of Anesthesia, as we celebrate her and her success and join her today in learning more about the important work that you do, Romy. So really a pleasure to be here. I also convey the good wishes of our Interim Vice Chancellor, uh, Professor Daya Reddy, who could not attend this evening because he's overseas. And I want to take this special moment to do a very, very special welcome to say how pleased we are with all of you being here, but especially Romy's loved ones. We know that the journey to becoming a professor isn't an easy one. And so to everyone who supported Romy along this journey, uh, we really like to say we are very grateful that you are here and for having been with her on, this, uh, on her journey to success. So let me introduce firstly the platform party, uh, beginning with uh, Professor Lionel Green Thompson, our Dean of Health Sciences. Uh, Professor Bickard, who is the Head of Anesthesia, and uh, Pr Associate Professor Tori Mads um, Madden, uh, and of course, Romy Parker. Uh, Romy is a colleague, and so I can't call you Professor all of the time, but, uh, <laughs> but we, we know each other for such a long time that it's Romy uh, from the time we know each other. Uh, but just to say that uh, Romy has been through a long journey and it's been a very special one and she's going to tell us a lot more about what it takes to become a professor through knowledge production and the inaugural lecture celebrates this it celebrates the value that somebody brings uh, with their lifetime of dedication to producing new knowledge that is relevant to the lives of all people and so her topic for this evening i'm sure we all very very keen on learning more about pain and suffering, Romy, is part of all our lives and that you have interventions that can support us, I think really it speaks to the importance of your work. And just to say that in, in terms of UCT's history and its uh, uh, dedication really to uh, scholarly research, but that being socially responsive, uh, this happened even before the United Nations introduced the Sustainable Development Goals in 2015. And I think, Romy, your work precedes all of this, right? It started long ago, and it really has been that engagement with people on the ground and learning more about how people live with pain and what is it that we should do uh, in an interdisciplinary way. Working across disciplines, as we know, is not easy. But actually, for the problems that we have, it is an essential part of how we generate knowledge, but more importantly, how we engage with the practices. And Romy is going to share some of that with us. So with all of that, Romy, I hope that we are going to walk away today thinking long and hard about pain and suffering, physical, psychological, spiritual, 
and that this is going to encourage us to continue to do the work that we all do and to celebrate everything that you bring with you today. So thank you very much. And I now hand over to Professor Bickard, uh, who will uh, introduce you and introduce our inaugural lecture. Thank you. Right, afternoon. Um, it's really an honor and a privilege to introduce uh, Professor Roaming Parker for an inaugural lecture. I think this is the first time I've worn a tie in about <laughs> 30 years. But Romy and I met at 1988 and as rowers at UCT. Um, so this is my UCT rowing tie. From then, I haven't worn it since about then. <laughs> and now uh, here we are, 35 years later, as friends and colleagues. So it really is a privilege for me to be able to do this introduction. So rowing is um, it's about dedication, hard work and teamwork. And I want to show you that Romy has followed these principles really throughout her career and has resulted in many successes. She's a well-rounded leading academic who excels holistically, both in research, education and particularly service to others. Her personal goal is that every South African should have access to a healthcare who understands pain. And I think she's well on the road to this admirable goal. If we look at her undergraduate and postgraduate training, she completed a BSc in physio uh, physiotherapy uh, at UCT, and then a BSc in exercise science, then an MSc in pain in Edinburgh, and in 2013, a PhD through the Department of Psychiatry here at UCT with the topic pain in HIV and AIDS, characteristics, contributing factors, and the effects of a six-week peer-led exercise and education intervention. Her outstanding pain research has resulted in an NRF rating and over 70 peer-reviewed publications. I think with her increasing expertise in the field, she's moved from describing the size and shape of the problem to developing and testing interventions which are novel, relevant, sustainable, and efficacious in our environment. One of Romy's biggest strengths is that she's managed to translate her research into teaching and education, and she's now a leading educationist. I believe she's achieved this through two characteristics, an immense capacity to supervise, and her ability to teach. She has supervised over 43 masters and seven PhDs. I think um, what catapulted her teaching career was the completion of the postgraduate diploma in health professional education here at UCT with distinction. She subsequently developed and now convenes a postgraduate diploma in interdisciplinary pain management. This is the first and only program on the continent. This has culminated in Romy being awarded the UCT Distinguished Teachers Award in 2019, and this is the university's highest honor for teaching. Finally, she has a tremendous cap capacity for leadership and service. I've selected some of her leadership roles amongst numerous others. These include a counselor for the International Association for the Study of Pain, vice president of Pain SA, past chair of the Pain, Mind and Movement Special Interest Group of the International Association for Study of Pain. She's an honorary life member of the Pain Management Physio Group of South Africa, she is Director of Train Pain Academy. This is a not-for-profit organization which offers training in pain management. 
I think an example of her standing and respect within a field is that she has chaired the scientific committee for the uh, Pan SA Congress three times. Romy is currently on sabbatical. She's writing an open access book on pain and pain management, where it puts the patient and the community front and center. I think she is really well and truly on the road to achieving her objective that no South African won't have, that, <laughs> that every South African will have access to a healthcare professional that understands pain. Finally, Romy has not achieved these incredible successes to the exclusion of all else. She is happily married to Ken Finley. Welcome. He is also a leading scientist in marine biology, and I know they spend many happy hours enjoying our land and ocean. She also manages to continue to exercise and compete at the highest level, having in recent years won two silver medals in the World Marathon canoeing jumps. Romy, I'm proud to call you a friend, colleague, and a mentor. Thank you and congratulations. Colleagues, friends and family, Professor Romy Parker. Have you I'm turned that? Switch it off now. You've got to have the right microphone working, otherwise your ears will get assaulted. Well, thank you, everyone, for, for being here. And um, bear with me while I get through the first emotional minutes of, of standing up here and, and seeing all of you and trying to say some things that, that mean a lot to me. And I, I want to start today by acknowledging my roots. And by that, I mean by acknowledging the people and the places and the spaces that I've been so privileged to encounter and experience through my life. From the start in, in Rio de Janeiro, for those of you who don't know, I spent my early years there and it might explain some of my spontaneous outbursts and enthusiastic, passionate ways but to here, to the foot of Africa, where I have really put down my roots that I claim as home. I want to acknowledge my family, human and fur, my friends, my husband and best friend, Ken. Thank you for being part of this journey with me. My colleagues, Colleagues and collaborators who contributed just so much to my career, but just to the richness of my life, that coming to work has been such a challenge and a pleasure and, and so rewarding. Thank you. And finally, I wish to acknowledge the First Nations people who regard this place here on the foot of the mountain as a sacred place of healing. Because I too, believe that working in healthcare is sacred. There is something sacred about connecting with somebody in their vulnerable moments when someone is ill and in pain and they trust me enough to allow me to walk beside them at that time. It's transformative for both of us and that is sacred. And so I want to acknowledge that this place carries that history for all of us. Okay, I seem to have chosen a very wordy title and when I hear Bruce repeat my PhD title, it's clearly a habit of mine. Um, but I hope that, that the words that I've put in the title don't overwhelm the message. So I want to invite you on a journey with me. A little bit of reflection, a little bit of contextualization, 
and then some questions about the future and where are we going. So why pain? How on earth did a sports physiotherapist end up in the Department of Anesthesia and Perioperative Medicine leading a team interested in pain? What on earth happened there? Well, I was working in the town of Hereford, which is on the border of Wales, and I had this unique group of patients suffering from rheumatological conditions. I was the rheumatoid physiotherapist. And they were an incredible bunch of people because most of them were farmers. Now, farming in Wales <laughs> is not a lot of fun. It's, a, it's about knee deep in mud for most of the year, going out and getting newly born lambs off the hills in sleet and rain, and, uh, and just getting on with the day-to-day -day business of farming. And these patients had rheumatoid arthritis, which is quite a systemic, overall, full-body condition. And yet, never did I hear them complain about pain. Occasionally, I get a call from them saying, oh, my knee's blown up. Sorry, I can't do a Welsh accent. Oh, my knee has blown up. You know, can I come in and we sort it out? Because, you know, spring's coming. It's lambing season or but they, they never complained about pain. I had another patient, an amazing woman who was a professional artist, rheumatoid arthritis. Her fingers were deviated at odd angles. Her elbows bent in ways that really shouldn't be happening. Her joints were destroyed by the disease, essentially. And yet, she continued to paint. This is her artwork that she produces despite her condition. And again, never did I hear her complain about pain. And then I had another group of patients with newly diagnosed rheumatoid arthritis, really no joint damage at all, some inflammatory markers on their bloods, whose lives were destroyed by pain, where pain was a feature every day. They couldn't function it was unraveling them as people. And so I started to ask myself the question, what's going on? What is pain? And that's when I started studying and headed off to Edinburgh to do my master's in pain. So let's have a look at this. What is pain? What do you think? Is this person in pain? Yes? No? What about her? Them? Are they in pain? So I'm the emotional pain, physical pain, pain. What about this person? Are they in pain? Yeah, but, but isn't that interesting? They, they've got a tattoo. Do they or don't they have pain from a needle? What about this person? Do you think they're in pain? Certain about that? What if they're under anesthetic? Are they in pain? Are they in pain then when they're under anesthetic? It's a complicated thing, isn't it? You feel how uncomfortable we feel looking at these pictures and trying to work out, well, are they, aren't they? The only way to know whether someone is in pain is to ask them. You cannot judge whether someone is in pain by looking at them or looking at their x-rays. The only way to know is to ask them. So let's unpack this a little bit more. Have we all done this? Has ever, we've all stabbed our toes at some point in our lives, haven't we? Really sore, right? Let's think about it, though. What if you stub your toe on a good day? Like a great day. Weather's fantastic. Everyone has come around for a braai. All your friends, all your family, everyone's brought meat. There's like a fabulous pile of food, salads trifle, chocolate, you name it, it's there. 
there's an ice bucket full of beer and wine and all your favorite drinks that you could ask for. And someone shouts from outside, perhaps Lionel, the fire's ready, coming. And I pick up the tray of meat and head outside. As I walk out the door, my little toe catches the door and it goes. <laughs> what happens? <laughs> my family knows me well, I swear. Ah! Something comes out of your mouth. It hurts, right? How long does it last for? Not too long? What does everybody around you do? Well, it depends, right? My family would probably laugh and go, are you okay? Don't drop the meat. Don't drop the meat. Right? Doesn't take you a moment. You're right, I'm fine, I'm fine. You shake your foot, off you go. Let's get the bride going. And it's over. If you're lucky, one person at the end of the day leaving says, how's your toe? What, my, my, no. oh, 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 no, it's fine. What about stabbing your toe on a bad day? Freezing cold, you can feel it, right? You've worked two weeks in a row, everyone else keeps calling in sick, but you just keep going to work. You've had the worst fight ever with your most precious person in your life. Your bank account's looking so negative, you're afraid to even look at it. Your alarm goes off, you walk into the bathroom, kind of not really wanting to wake up and face the day. And as you walk into the bathroom, your baby toe catches the door. And it goes, <coughs> how much does it hurt? A lot? A lot, a lot? I sat on the floor and cried for about half an hour once. It's broken. It's so sore. It's agony, right? Not only is it agony then, but all day you can feel it swelling up inside your shoe. You keep having to take your shoe off. In fact, because it's a bad day, it may swell up, whereas on the good day, it wouldn't. Because pain is not about tissue damage. It could be exactly the same injury to my toe on those two different days, but the pain would be completely different because pain is about more. Pain is a conscious construct of my brain. It's a sensory emotion. It doesn't matter whether you break my heart or you break my leg, it is pain. <clears throat> if we do functional MRI scans of people in mourning, in pain from loss, we see the same brain activity as the pain they experience from a fracture or physical trauma, apart from one or two areas saying, oh, it's there, it's your leg or it's your heart. But pain is a sensory emotion. And it's a conscious construct. Thank goodness for anesthetics. Thank you, guys. Because without you, we'd never come back for second surgery because we would wake up and go, that was really sore, not happening again. But we don't experience pain when we're unconscious. Ultimately, Pain is something that we experience when we feel threatened as people. I'm threatened when I lose someone I love. I'm threatened when I'm injured. I am threatened when life is overwhelming. And pain is an appropriate response in those situations because pain gets your attention. It draws your mind to it and gets you to evaluate what is going on right now. And what do I need to do to create safety? And that all happens in microseconds, seconds, as you burst out crying and go, Mom! That is why you're doing that, is to create safety and treat your pain. Our brains are continuously sampling the internal 
and external environment at a subconscious level, continually checking in how safe or dangerous are things right now? Are we okay? No, generate pain. Yeah, I hear a danger signal, but been here before, not a problem. How many of you have ever cut yourself and not noticed it? You had that? And then someone comes along and goes, you're bleeding. And you, you look at it and you see the blood. What happens then? Then it stings, right? It wasn't, same tissue damage, wasn't sore a second ago. Now it's painful. But now your brain has more information. A second ago, your brain was probably getting information going, ah, don't worry about it, it's fine. Now your brain goes, oh, blood, oh, oh, that, that is dangerous. Better generate pain. Got to go wash that, put a plaster on it, right? Pain is about human beings. It is not an accurate measure of tissue damage. It varies based on a whole lot of other stuff. So what do you think? This is someone with grade four osteoarthritis with their knees. Do you think they're in pain? Maybe. 30% of people with x-rays like this have never had any joint pain. Because it's about more than that. We have no susception. Now, those of you who trained when Bruce and I did, were taught we had pain nerves. There are plenty of you in this room. You remember learning about pain nerves? We were told that A delta and C fibers are pain nerves. No, they're not. Because they can fire and not generate pain. It's my brain that generates pain. They are no susceptors. They are nerves that fire in response to something potentially dangerous happening. But it's my brain that gets the information. Does a fancy computer processing and goes, yes, dangerous, pain. No, shut up, we're busy right now. It's a good party. Be quiet. So no susception is the transmission of an action potential in response to a potentially tissue damaging stimulus. So if you catch any physiology textbooks in the library that talk about A delta and C fibers as pain nerves, I might go in there and cross it out and write no susceptors. That's actually what they are. Pain is our sensory emotion in response to threat. They are different things. And I'm pushing this point home because too often we decide on treatment for people based on imaging or on tissue issues only. And pain is not purely about tissue issues, it's about people. This graph is telling us about people who have no pain. No pain at all. 40% of people at the age of 20 with no pain have disc degeneration on MRI scan. If I look at the average age of this room, <laughs> I won't be rude. No pain. If we do imaging on people, we see plenty that's potentially wrong. But human beings are actually more resilient than that. We have the capacity to deal with mechanical abnormalities and compensate. Treating people based on imaging only is one dimensional and pain is multi dimensional. It is absolutely possible to feel pain in the absence of no susception. If I investigate you, do every blood test, scan, everything possible and find nothing wrong, it is invalid for me to tell you that you're not really in pain, pull yourself together. 
It's all in your head. Pain is pain. The pain of heartbreak and the pain of loss is real. As I said, those functional MRI scans are the same. It is also possible to have no susception and no pain. And you've all experienced that. The unexplained pub injury that we experienced as undergraduates teaches us a lot. What happened last night? I have no idea, but that's an impressive bruise. So if pain is such a complicated thing, we need ways of making sense of it and getting a handle on it in one way or another. So a couple of things that we do is we classify pain. Now, one of the most common classifications that many of you will be familiar with is time-based classifications. So acute pain and chronic pain. You all heard those, right? So acute pain, kind of normal pain, occurs in the first two to six weeks of an injury. Normal. Chronic pain is defined as pain that's been present for more than three months. Seems fairly random, that number. Not random at all. These timelines are based on tissue healing times. Most tissues are healed by three months. Even your slipped disc. The first phase of healing, the inflammatory phase, what happens in the inflammatory phase? Pain often gets worse before it gets better. You go up Table Mountain, you haven't done it for a while, you come down, you're sore on day one, you know day two, you're going to be doing that duck walk thing. Oh, oh, that was quite sore. Inflammatory phase, normal. Stage two tissue regeneration phase, up to six weeks. And most injuries are healed by six weeks. You've watched enough sport to know this. A rugby player gets injured on a match. Everyone's like, oh, how long is it going to be before they're back on the field? Six weeks. Tissue healing times. There's still a little bit of remodeling that goes on up until three months. By three months, most tissue healing processes are done. And that is why we refer to chronic pain as pain that is present beyond three months, because now it is a problem in and of itself. It is no longer about the tissues. It's about something else. But these time-based classifications, acute and chronic, requires a lot of thinking for you to get to that point, right? So we've actually moved beyond time-based classifications of pain. Now we talk about mechanism-based classifications. So the three mechanism-based classifications that we refer to are nociceptive, neuropathic, and nociplastic pain. So nociceptive pain, pain that we know and love, the pain that we experience when we cut ourselves or injure ourselves, and when we heal, the pain gets better. It's the pain that we experience when the nociceptors fire, and it's a normal process. Neuropathic pain tells you in its name. It's when there's pathology of the nervous system. So the nerve has been injured, either a peripheral nerve or in the central nervous system. And when those nerves are injured, they often fire spontaneously. And that generates horrible electrical shooting, tingling, pins and needles pain that comes out of nowhere. And then we have nociplastic pain. Pain that arises because the nociceptive system has changed its plasticity. One of the most common metaphors that we use to help people understand nociplastic pain is that you can think about the pain system in your body as an alarm system, but a really sophisticated alarm system. The burglar alarm in our house is not that sophisticated. It only goes off when someone opens the door, comes in and looks inside, you know, like the disasters happen. The alarm system in your body is much more sophisticated than that. The alarm goes off when the dodgy person's looking in the window. You know that, right? You put your hand on something hot and you, ow! Oh, it's not burnt, right? It goes off when someone's looking in the window. Now, when you have nociplastic pain, that alarm has become so sensitive that it's going off when someone's just walking down the street, 
A bird flies by. Fly flies across the room. Nothing dangerous going on here, but the alarm keeps going off. There are many conditions that we now recognize to be nociplastic pain, including things like fibromyalgia, irritable bowel syndrome, temporomandibular joint disorder. These are all from sensitive system. Mechanism-based classification is so helpful because it immediately for us as clinicians makes us think about what is the physiology? What's the pathology? What's going on here that I can target in my treatment? It's not just the nervous system, it's all of it. So what? You're in pain, suck it up. We're South Africans, get on it. Why do we care? Yes, we have an ethical responsibility. We want to reduce suffering. But why is it so important for us to pay attention to pain? The three eyes of pain, pain interrupts. It interrupts you, right? When you're in pain, stops you thinking, stops you doing, stops you engaging. But it doesn't just interrupt you in that way, it interrupts your physiology in multiple ways. People with severe pain post-operatively are more likely to suffer an MI in the post-operative period. People with severe post-operative pain are more likely to suffer from a whole range of complications from infliction, infections to delayed wound healing to whole range, depression, you name it. It interrupts us as human beings. It interrupts our relationships. It interrupts our meaningful life roles. It interrupts our fun. It interrupts our joy. And then it interferes. You can try to push through it, right? We all try to push through your pain. I can, I can, it's, it's not gonna get the better of me. But then it starts to interfere with everything that you are and the things that you want to do. And if it keeps going, it starts to change your identity. I can't tell you how many patients come to us in the chronic pain clinic and say to us, I'm not myself anymore. I don't recognize myself. I feel bad for my partner. This isn't the person that they chose to spend their lives with. It interrupts who we are. So as healthcare professionals, when we're treating pain, treating people. And that is such a privilege. We're not in a health system when we're treating pain of reductionism, of getting it down to the tiny little molecule that I've got to nail and get right. I have the privilege of engaging with all of the human being and their environment and who they are. So that's why pain is important. Is it a problem in South Africa? Let me tell you a little bit about some of the research that we've done here. So we've done a range of cross-sectional studies describing the size and shape of the problem in South Africa. One of the earliest pieces of work I did with Professor Jennifer Jelsma, who mentored me, we looked at how many people presenting at community health centers in Cape Town were suffering from musculoskeletal joint pain. 36% of people sitting in a waiting room at a community health center were reporting moderate to severe pain that was interfering with their quality of life. And then further work with our PhD students, Rolene and Candice, 62% of women 
in the free state at a community health center, we're reporting chronic joint pain. 45% in Cape Town. That's a lot of people living with pain every day of their lives. Our, our work looking at chronic pain and people living with HIV, which I did for as part of my PhD work with Dan Stein and, and Jennifer. These were women with well controlled HIV coming to the clinic just for routine follow ups, doing great. Low viral loads, good CD4 counts, stable. 74% of them suffering to moderate, from moderate to severe pain. Moderate pain is the kind of pain that, that you're looking for a panado that's interrupting you, that's really getting to you. Living with that every day of their lives. So it's a group of 230 women that we interviewed. Two of them were receiving analgesia. The rest had been told, oh, just drink some water when you're in pain. If we look at work from my colleagues at WITS, uh, Peter Kamam and Tony Wadley and their group, also looking at people living with HIV across the country, we see similar rates of pain in people living with HIV, pain that interferes with their function and their participation and their quality of life. That's chronic pain. What about acute pain? Let's say we're doing better with acute pain. Our work here and it's New Somerset Hospital. 18% of women post cesarean section had any documentation of pain assessment taking place. Many of them were getting treatment. But based on what and how do we know whether that treatment is working or not? More recent work, two thirds of the women had severe pain in the first 24 hours post cesarean section. When you're trying to bond with your newborn baby, severe pain, not helpful. And that severe pain was present for more than 40% of the time. And that is a concern because severe pain present for more than 40% of the time significantly increases your risk of developing persistent post-surgical pain. And following trauma, you've been in a car accident, had a couple of fractures, you needed surgery, 50% of our patients here in this hospital had no documentation of their pain being assessed. And in those who had their pain assessed, severe pain more than 40% of the time in more than half of them. Not a pretty picture. Phantom limb pain, we're not doing much better either. So this work, led by Dr. Kaplehu Dimakatsu, who's now doing a postdoctoral uh, position at the University of New South Wales, um, and Dr. Franklin and Blorvu, who did the work for his MBED um, in the Eastern Cape. It's pretty sobering, these numbers, isn't it? More than 50% of people who had had an amputation at this hospital were suffering from phantom limb pain a year post-surgery. And then five hospitals in the Eastern Cape, 98% of the patients reported phantom limb pain when we phoned them. Phantom limb pain disturbs your life, disturbs your sleep, disturbs your emotions, impairs your ability to re rehabilitate and recover and re-engage in any kind of life. And in breast cancer survivors and prostate cancer survivors, our small pilot data shows similarly worrying figures. This is not people who are experiencing pain at the site of their mastectomy or at the site of their surgery or the intervention. These are people who are suffering from noceplastic pain.
pain at multiple sites all over their bodies because their system has become sensitized. And in the emergency setting, Andre Lawrence's work with Peter Hodkinson for her PhD in emergency medicine looked at the records of people who had been scooped off the side of the road and brought to hospital, those people who save our lives. Only 18% of them had any documentation of whether they had any pain. And most of them had, when it was documented, they had significant pain. Chances are everybody scooped off the side of the road is in pain. So what's the full picture for South Africa? So work from Sean Chetty and Peter Kahneman, population-based work, one in five South Africans is living with chronic pain. That's pain on most days for more than three months. Imagine how you would feel being in pain for most days, day after day after day. Not a happy place to be, is it? The most common reason why people come to us for help is because of pain. We need to be paying attention to it. So what can we do about pain? Now that I've depressed you all and made you feel this burden enormously, what can we do about it? Can we make a difference? Yes, we can. If pain is about more than nociception, well, we have amazing things to do for nociception. Drugs are great. But look at all the other things we can do for pain too. We can engage with people more widely, culturally, meeting people where they are. We can engage psychologically. We can engage with people's beliefs. And while on this side it says religion, what about some of the fragility beliefs that we have as a society about how weak the body is and how if you sit like that for any longer, your spine's going to be completely ruined. And of course, your knees are a disaster if you're going to run that far and your biomechanics is terrible. But wait a minute, we saw those x-rays earlier of people with grade four osteoarthritis and no pain. So what about the resilience of the human being? Engaging with beliefs in a different way. Thinking about social factors. Instead of working in a biopsychosocial model, should we be working in a socio-psycho-biological model? Thinking about people in context first. So much that we can do for pain. But are we teaching and training our healthcare professionals to do this? And this is a global problem around the world in healthcare professional training. All of us get very little time on pain. A couple of hours for some professions. In fact, our veterinary colleagues get 10 times as many hours on pain education and management than human healthcare professionals. Graduates have poor knowledge and skills and attitudes to managing pain. Our graduates from our programs here, physiotherapy, occupational therapy and medicine, struggle with having the knowledge and skills and attitudes that are required to really manage pain. And the attitudes are important. I am a massive advocate of the interdisciplinary team. We run a postgraduate diploma in interdisciplinary pain management. 
So we all know about multidisciplinary teams, right? Work in multidisciplinary teams, but multidisciplinary teams are like a traditional orchestra. Everyone has their place, everyone has their seat, and everyone knows who the conductor is, and you will follow the conductor. An interdisciplinary team is a jazz band. A really good jazz band doesn't just play for an audience, it plays with the audience. The audience drives the music. A really good jazz musician doesn't just know their instrument, they know the other instruments as well. Sometimes just for fun, swap them around and take them back again. And where's the leadership of a jazz band? Well, it depends on the music, doesn't it? Depends where the music is going and what the music needs as to who takes the leadership role in a jazz band. And a really good jazz band has the audience as a leader too. If we're working in pain, we need to be jazz bands. We need to be working together with a really good understanding of what each of us brings to the music. And the person with pain may be the audience, but they drive the music. And ultimately our goal is that they take the leadership. And we need to be training for interdisciplinary teams. So I'm going to give you some hope. What have we learned about treating pain in South Africa? We can make a difference, a really significant difference to people's lives. For chronic pain, we have done studies on people with chronic nociplastic pain conditions. We have done studies in people with chronic pain related to osteoarthritis and chronic pain in people living with HIV. For each of these interventions, we have these different workbooks, which are available open access, that clinicians can use them around the country and around the world. And what have we shown? These programs integrate educating patients about their condition in a conversation, not dumping information on people, but really personalizing the conversation about what is going on and why do you have pain? We use exercise, not just saying it would be a good idea if you would, but let's get up and do it. Let's get your body moving again and let's restore your confidence in what your body can do. Let's re-engage. We use mindfulness-based approaches because there's such powerful strategies for rewiring that sensitized nervous system. And we pay attention to sleep and sleep hygiene because if you're not sleeping, you're in pain. And these six week programs reduce pain, restore quality of life, and make a difference. Whether they are led by physios or psychologists, or whether they are peer led by expert patients. So this, these are the results from one of our studies on people with hip and knee osteoarthritis waiting for their joint replacements. And you're all aware that people may wait two or three years to get their surgery. So while they were waiting, they joined us for six weeks, education, exercise, mindfulness, goal setting, re-engagement. And the people who participated in the programs had significant reductions in pain, which lasted for six months and actually lasted for a year when we followed up beyond then, compared with those who continued to wait for their surgery. And several of these patients came along to us and said, you can take me off the list. Don't worry about that joint replacement. I'm good. We see similar results in people with wide nociplastic pain conditions, and in people with HIV, 
Look at how their pain got better. Oh, wait a minute. Hold on. That's the control group. How come they got better too? Let's just take another look at this. These were women that we interviewed to find out whether they were in pain. That data, 74% of them were in pain. We went back 15 months later and they were still in pain. We randomized them to an experimental and a control group. The experimental group participated in peer-led weekly sessions. The control group, we did something that happens so often in our clinics, we just gave them the workbook. Here's a bit of information that might be useful for you. And I know when that happens to me in the clinic, I don't know, it gets lost in a pocket somewhere in the bottom of a drawer. It doesn't get read. We interviewed these women at the end of the study. What happened? That workbook you gave me was amazing. I invited all my friends around for coffee once a week and we worked through it and we saw the exercises in the book and we did it together. Amazingly empowered group of women that completely destroyed my PhD research. <laughs> <laughs> but what does that teach us? It teaches us that people are strong and resilient and we give them the resources they may be able to engage and that ultimately participating in a group made a difference made a really meaningful difference and if we consider our healthcare system for most people it is an incredibly hostile environment we might love walking into this building no one in their right mind likes walking in this building. It's a hostile environment. People do not feel seen and cared for. And yet when we run groups, what do we pay so much attention to? Seeing you, and getting to know you, and listening, and supporting each other. And that is critically important for people to recover. And we learned this even more in recent work during COVID. Because our outpatient clinics were shut down. And so we got together. Said, what are we going to do? And the idea came up that we would run virtual groups using WhatsApp. I had my doubts, took some convincing, but we went for it. And we created little podcasts and resources, and we set up groups using WhatsApp groups, and we did once a week video calls, and they exercised together on the videos, getting a bit nervous that somebody on the other side of the camera was, and you can't catch them but it's okay, they did all right. And we evaluated whether working in this virtual environment was going to have the same effects. Would people feel that it was beneficial? Would they feel that actually this is worthwhile? Is this something feasible for us to explore doing more of in the future? And we did some lovely qualitative work, some of my colleagues here interviewing these patients after they had participated in these groups. They described going on a journey with their fellow pain sufferers in this virtual environment and reaching a destination where they were transformed. I am positive, I'm not depressed, I'm looking forward to life, I am alive. I am alive. I'm not just existing anymore. I am a person. How much does that tell you of what pain had taken away from that person? You need to know that every single thing changed. 
everything changed. My mindset changed, my body changed, my world changed. My way of thinking changed, my way of doing things has changed. Everything has changed. We can make significant differences for people with pain if we engage with them as people. And engaging with people with phantom limb pain also requires us to be flexible and think in different ways. Graded motor imagery research that Katleho did for his masters showed us that following a protocol to train the brain to adjust to the loss of a limb significantly reduces people's pain. Significantly. And that reduction in pain lasted for six months after doing six weeks of treatment. And that work in phantom limb pain is now ongoing as we explore and engage with how to make it accessible and meaningful across our diversity in South Africa. And acute pain? What about the post cesarean section trauma pain that made you all feel quite miserable? What are we doing there to make a difference? Well, we're in the middle of it. Middle of a quality improvement series of studies nationwide, the Pain Out project. And at the moment, we are working on empowering patients, educating patients. We are optimizing our perioperative analgesia, making sure that people are getting the right doses at the right times and being structured about what we're doing. And then we're being clear about paying attention to pain postoperatively, integrating pain assessment and management into our routine care, getting people to think about pain as a fifth vital sign, that it's routinely part of what we do. We look forward to seeing some changes after that. So, we know that pain is affecting significant numbers of South Africans. But we also know we have a range of effective treatments to make a meaningful difference for them. So where to from here? What needs to happen next? We still have questions about the mechanisms. We still have questions about the physiology. And so Tori Madden is leading a team who's doing remarkable novel work in the laboratory to help us understand the interactions between the psychological, the neural and the immune systems and how they contribute to pain and making people vulnerable to having persistent pain. And we're developing a model to explore using a hub and spoke model to use virtual groups to allow people in rural settings to zoom into us here at Critiscure, zoom into a group of other South Africans in rural places so that they can be part of a group and engage in a rehabilitation program, that we can increase our reach without people at the primary health care level going, you want us to do more? But use what we've learned through COVID to reach more people. Every South African with pain deserves to be able to access a healthcare professional who understands it. Pain is interrupting too many lives and interfering and changing people's identities. And they deserve to have us paying attention. So some of the ways we can make a difference is by producing clinical recommendations to help clinicians across the country 
giving them guidelines of how to do this because we struggle when we haven't been taught at an undergraduate level. We can empower people. Teach, teach, teach. Good thing I love doing it. Undergraduates, postgraduates, and the public more widely. I taught at summer school this year for the first time, and it was terrifying and fabulous at the same time. And I encourage all of you, if you have an opportunity to teach at summer school, to engage in that kind of dissemination to our society. And then the project that we're currently working on. This is our book, Understanding Pain, Unraveling Physiology, Assessment and Management of Pain Through South African Stories. I see my habit of really long titles continues. <laughs> A unique book where every chapter is about one person where every chapter we are co-writing with people with pain, where the chapter might start, hi, my name's Romy. I'm a physio and I'm supposed to be the pain queen, but boy, when I had pain, that counted for nothing. Let me tell you my story. Every chapter is about a person and all their complexity. And we're writing it in a way that is engaging for undergraduates, but also for people at the community service level, health officer level, who are so often thrown in the deep end without guidelines of where to go. So it's starting to look like a book. We look forward to bringing it to you all. So what about you? Now that you've learned about pain, if we understand that pain is about threat, what can each of us do to create safety for the person in front of us? How can we engage differently to create safe spaces? And I want to end with this card. This card was given to me by the very first person I worked with with chronic pain after I finished my master's. Thank you for giving me my life back. That's a sacred moment to interact with someone in that way. It's not magic about seeing people, meeting with them, and working together to restore their lives. It's an immense privilege. And I thank you all for allowing me to grow in this environment and in this way and to continue pursuing this. Thank you. I think we all feel inspired. We have so many more questions, Romy, <laughs> than, we, than we had at the beginning. And throughout it, I think I was just inspired at so many levels. And, and the one thing that I think stood out for me has to be who you are as a person and the teacher you are. I mean, that was just, I think, incredibly uh, um, uh, deep in terms of what you shared with us, but it was how you took us through that process. And I think that shows the care that you bring, not just with your patients, but with your students as well. 
And I think that almost is why Romi is so celebrated for the important work that you've done in the teaching space. What you've told us today is that we should all carry the message, we should all be teachers, and that this is actually going to drive a lot of the work that we're doing around educational change, because it is through that that we're actually going to reach the kind uh, or the masses of people that we still need to serve. So thank you for bringing such a human message into this uh, inaugural lecture. And I think it really, for everybody else that's here in the room watching, uh, it certainly inspires us to continue with the work that we all so believe in. So thank you very much for that. And so over to uh, uh, Professor Madden, uh, who is going to move the vote of things. Good evening, Deputy Vice-Chancellor and Dean and guests and Romy, of course, and particularly Romy's family. It is my great privilege to deliver the vote of thanks um, for Professor Romy Parker, who I realized I've known for just shy of 20 years. First as her student, then as her mentee, now as her mentee and her colleague and her collaborator and her friend. <laughs> That's um, lecture Romy was an inspiring account um, of, I think, the way that your personal and clinical and intellectual journey has been so shaped by how deeply you care about people, and particularly about people um, who have pain, but I think you care that much about all people, um, and how your journey has also been directed and sustained by that caring, um, and, and really also only only slightly actually touched on the remarkable change that your journey has yielded in our collective ability to care for people. Uh, and really that deep caring um, is what stands out about you and, and your whole journey and how you interact with us all. And, and I was reflecting on, on what your journey has yielded and um, at a kind of broader level, it's yielded a generation of clinicians who are better equipped to help people with pain. It's yielded a generation of students who are better at asking questions about pain um, and questioning management and assessment procedures um, and, and advocating for those to be better. Um, and thousands and probably tens of thousands of people who, who live with pain have received better treatment as a result of, of you. And that's a, just a phenomenal impact. It is phenomenal. Uh, and so I think your impact is truly, truly worth, worthy of the title of professor, and it must have been so easy for the review panel to confirm your promotion. <laughs> um, as, as we've all seen this evening, Romy is a teacher in the richest sense. Yes, she will give you a lot of information, but she's much more interested in growth. And so that was a really unusual lecture from Romy, to stand up and talk in a didactic style. You're far more likely to find her perching on the edge of a desk at the front of the classroom to discuss. Um, and she's invested in fostering a context that makes it safe for people to ask questions and to reconsider their ideas. That is truly teaching, truly educating. Uh, so, of course, Bruce um, pointed out that she was given the Distinguished Teacher Awards um, at UCT, and I must say that I was so glad that she had finally agreed to be nominated for it, because I had been asking her if we could nominate her for several years. So, well done, Jill, for convincing Romy to finally agree. Um, and in that portfolio, you could just see countless students iterating their enthusiasm for Romy's teaching and the way she has grown so many people. The other thing that really stands out for me about Romy is that her research is so tightly linked to her clinical practice. Um, she nurtures her research questions slowly in a way that actually allows real life to genuinely shape her scientific direction. And in that, she stands out from so many other scientists in that her, her research is rooted in, in real life important questions and asking them in a way that's relevant. Um, she spoke about um, prioritizing interdisciplinary care, and um, it's brave to do that in a context where the hierarchy is the established norm. The South African healthcare system is incredibly hierarchical, um, but Romy has stuck with that and advocated for it consistently because it's better for people who have pain to receive care 
from a non-hierarchical interdisciplinary team than from the alternative. Romy's approach, as we all know, is really accessible, really honest, um, and she really believes in people and turns that belief into action. Um, she she asked that question, you asked that question, how can you create safety for people around you? And um, I've just returned from six months of maternity leave when Romy took everything that she could away from me in terms of my administrative responsibilities, management responsibilities, mentoring, supervising, all of it, everything that she could, she took away from me and said, spend time getting to know your new baby. And she was supposed to be on sabbatical, not doing a whole bunch of things like that. And that's just an amazing illustration of how she believes in people, she supports people, she releases people. And my team has benefited hugely from having closer mentorship from her. And I want to say that my child has benefited hugely and probably generations of my family from those six months of protected time. And that's just one example of, of how many people she's done that kind of thing for. I wanted to also touch on Romy behind the red gown, although Romy behind the red gown is not unfamiliar to us because she lives her life in such an integrated way already. Um, but I, I've drawn on a few stories and reflections from people who know her very closely. She, she referenced her time um, as a child in Brazil, and as a result of that, she can speak Portuguese, although she always points out that she can only speak a child's Portuguese, so she can't interact with, with adults in Portuguese, only with children. <laughs> Romy, as we've all seen, is incredibly passionate, um, in line with all the stereotypes about redheads, and um, her brother John referred to her fiery temper and said that when Romy was younger, to suggest there was any association between her temper and her then much redder hair colour was to invite serious bodily injury. <laughs> Perhaps first, uh, first uh, launching her interest in pain. Um, but he also pointed out that she's really learned to temper that in order to stay calm when she's angry in a way that's, um, that is really valuable. And I think many of us have seen that kind of passion behind Romy and the way she's able to use that um, to actually direct her anger into achieving important change, which is hugely valuable. Teresa Burgess, who um, became a fast friend of Romy's very early in Romy's days um, at UCT, spoke of Romy's phenomenal determination, which she also pointed out might be called sheer bloody mindedness. <laughs> um, and Bev Bolton, with whom Romy has um, advocated for improved training of clinicians and delivered um, improved training to clinicians in pain, spoke of Romy's bravery in tackling complex topics, in demanding fairness and access for all to healthcare, in pushing the boundaries of understanding to help people in pain, and particularly of her bravery to be kind and compassionate to other people, even when she herself is under huge pressure. And Bev said, it's a quality that has helped to make her so effective in her field, although that fearlessness is also a major reason why Bev will never ever go on a bush safari with Romy. <laughs> so Romy pours passion into her life in many ways. Bruce said, uh, pointed out that she is an international, actually gold medalist in the canoe marathon. Uh, and Rissa told a story about when they were backpacking in South America, Romy was pickpocketed and she used her child's Portuguese to shout thief prompting the whole bus to turn against the man, get her money back and get him off the bus. Talk about constructive use of anger. <laughs> Romy is also known for seeking out her life-giving spaces and for encouraging other people to do the same. Um, you can find her happiest and at peace when she's running her dogs on the mountain, when she's in the Kalahari or paddling at De Mont or on the Okavango with Ken or perhaps sinking down to that beautiful peace that exists 30 meters under the surface of the ocean. Romy is also an epic partier. <laughs> and uh, Bruce spoke about her having chaired the scientific committee of PNSA Congress several times. <laughs> I would say she's been a pretty consistent chair of the dance committee of PNSA. <laughs> and Tony Wadley and Peter Kalman pointed out that Romy basically is wherever the party is. In fact, she has also been known to also chair races in the pool after midnight at the PNSA Congress. <laughs> and Peter Kalman, who is an internationally established pain researcher himself, said this about Romy, the field of pain is filled with wonderful, skilled and clever people, but I have never seen anyone tackle pain from so many angles and so effectively as Romy. Her practice informs her research and her research informs her practice 
and her enthusiasm drags us all along for the ride. And speaking of dragging others along, apparently her explanation of the therapeutic benefits of cold exposure and exercise was enough to convince Teresa Burgess to learn to surf ski without any thermal gear in the middle of winter. <laughs> She's pretty convincing when she wants to be. And I also want to say that academia can demand full dedication. And Romy has successfully resisted being sucked in, maintaining her sense of self and staying true to her values. And her family and closest friends have shaped and supported her in that. To her father, Robin, who is not with us anymore, to her mother, Marita, who clearly did a phenomenal job of raising this remarkable woman. To her siblings, John and Rissa. John and Rissa. To her husband, Ken. And to her Labradors, those who've passed on to the two who sn still snuggle on her bed at night and wake her before dawn. Thank you for your love and support of Romy and for sharing her with us. And Romy, we are all grateful, deeply grateful, for the far reaching and real impact you've had and continue to have. And we look forward to this next stage of your journey now with the full title of professor. Congratulations. Thanks very much, Tori, for that excellent uh, vote of thanks. Um, as, as I was sitting and listening to, I was struck by the comment that uh, Professor Madden made about the review of the, um, the portfolio at the Promotions Committee. I have to agree with you, having chaired that committee for the first time <laughs> in quite an intimidating environment here. It was one of those that, that there were only superlatives to describe it, and in fact, as, a, as an attempt to ensure that other people had a facilitated access to professorship, we offered that portfolio as an example for how people should construct theirs. <laughs> and, and I'm struck that just this evening, Romy, I've directed somebody who's heading towards the award for teaching, that you're the person they should speak to to enhance their portfolio. So that wasn't a far shot. Um, but it, really, it's just my opportunity as the supposed head of this household to say a few words in conclusion. And I want to just make the point that inaugural lectures are really very much a part of our story as a faculty, as a university, and quite powerfully the story of our interaction with the people that we claim to serve. And so Romy, I thought that was quite an inimitable style of engagement as a teacher telling us sophisticated things in mundane kinds of language. And so I really am grateful for that as you delivered that to us this evening. But thank you to Ken and, and the family who's gathered with us. The, it's very rare that we have the occasion to sit alongside family and see just the places from whence our scholars have come. And I don't think we acknowledge that sufficiently. So thank you in all the many ways that you're a part of Romy's story. But Romy, I'm going to say a special thanks for, for your reflection on the sacredness of the space. Because you're the first inaugural speaker who does that in their lecture. And I want to honor that because it is a thing that I'm hoping becomes part of our regular discourse. This idea that we honor the ground on which we stand because truly the original peoples in this area call this area Kami Rodi Chais. Kami Rodi Chais. And they call it the place of the stars. I suspect because they too were illuminated by the stars as they created healing from the things they gathered here on the slopes of this mountain that they called Huriklaha once. And so for me, that acknowledgement is a really important thing. It's a vital part of who we are as faculty. And the notion that we that an inaugural lecture speaks about the legacy of a scholar, but con connects it to the promise that you make. And I'm really pleased to see that book emerging. I also want to just note this idea that as scholars, we must continue to reflect on what Romeo was saying about that, our, the fact that our knowledge is inscribed on the bodies of the vulnerable. That, that was such a powerful notion of connecting vulnerability to the story of our knowledge, and it, it is something that we should not forget. But the idea of pain is about people, both resilient people and people who are responsive if we give them an opportunity to participate in their healing. The idea that the hierarchy that you speak about is that we, pr we privilege cure, 
over prevention. And what you've taught us today is when, when patients collaborate, they become part of the story. But I'm going to use in conclusion because the, the, the pain is about people, but tonight is about people too. And I want to say thank you to you for joining us this evening. And I want to invite you to, to join us for some refreshments after this. But I'm going to use this evening in the words of the original people again. I get a sense because of their own sophistications of language, they had three grades of thank you. And their highest form of thank you is Kaisi Kai Gangans. And I want to say that to you, Romy, this evening. It is a significant pleasure to have been part of this this evening. Please join us for some refreshments after this. I'm going to ask you to stand as the procession leaves.